Welcome to the Vet Me Rehabilitation Podcast, where we aim to help fellow Vet Me rehab therapists increase their knowledge and elevate their practice. I'm Megan Kelly. And I'm Anae Lloyd. Together, we bring you the latest insights, research, and information in the field of veterinary rehabilitation. This podcast is brought to you by Online Pet Health, a leading continued education membership for veterinary rehabilitation therapists. With Online Pet Health, you'll have access to a wide range of online resources to help you stay up to date with the latest techniques, advances, and trends in the industry. Our podcast features in-depth conversations with leading experts in veterinary rehabilitation. They share their own experiences and knowledge to help you improve your practice. Whether you're a seasoned pro or just starting out in the field, our goal is to provide you with the tools and the insights you need to succeed. So join us as we explore the exciting world of vet knee rehabilitation and help you take your practice to the next level. Welcome to the Veterinary Rehabilitation Podcast. Today, it is only a few days to go till the Vet Rehab Summit on the 10th and 11th of November, and we cannot wait. We have one more prelim to share with you ahead of the summit, and that is an interview that we held with Michelle Broadhurst about the myofascial system and the connections to the meridians, specifically the San Zhao meridian or more commonly known as the triple heater or triple burner meridian. This was a very interesting conversation where we discussed the connection between between the Eastern approach, understanding the meridians, and how we're starting to understand the myofascial chains and their anatomy and those connections between one another. Before we jump into our interview, I just want to give a shout out to our sponsors, Respond Systems. Choosing the right therapy laser and PEMF systems for your practice are big decisions, and that's why Respond Systems has been helping to make that decision easier for over 40 years by offering both Class 3B and Class 4 lasers, as well as a full line of PEMF products designed for small animals and horses. As part of the Poor Prosper family of brands, Respond Systems is dedicated to providing you with a customer and patient-centric approach to rehabilitation. Find out more at responsystems.com. Hi guys. Hi Michelle. Thank you for joining me. Hello. Today we're talking about that connection between the meridians and the myofascial lines and specifically the San Zhao line. Michelle Broadhurst is going to introduce herself in a second, but while I'm waiting for all of you to come online and join me, I just wanted to share with you again what the Vet Rehab Summit is and how you can register. So if you're new to our community and to the space of Online Pet Health, Online Pet Health provides continuing education to rehab therapists around the world. And we're primarily doing that in the form of webinars every month within our membership. Um, In addition to the webinars in our membership, we also share research uh, summaries and business training on a monthly basis, because those are the areas that are really hard to keep up with when we're in practice, when we're running businesses or we're working. Yeah. So the Vetri Hub Summit is our annual online conference, and it's our opportunity to really collect live with our members and with our community. This year, our summit theme is the myofascial kinetic lines. We have Vipka Schultz and Rika Albron presenting two days of lectures on the subject, um, talking about canines and equines. So I'm very excited about it. If you haven't registered yet for the summit, there are three ways that you can do that. The first is that you can register for a free limited access ticket. So you don't have to make any financial commitments. You just sign up and register and come and join us on the day. You'll be able to access one of our lectures, the first lecture in our lineup, but that lecture is two hours long. So this is a really huge bonus for our free um, our free attendees at this year's summit. And in addition to that, our free attendees get to visit all of our exhibitors and the majority of them have created some kind of um, some kind of thing for you guys to access. So between tools, uh, webinars, <clears throat> consultations, training videos, there's just there's a huge variety of, of opportunities from our sponsors or discounts um, on their various products. Our free attendees will be able to access all of that. 
then you can register for a standard ticket. That's the second way. So you buy a ticket, you come to the summit, you'll be able to access the entire summit, all of the content, um, all of the webinars, the lecturers, the exhibit, everything. Okay. Um, that's so that's the second way. The third way that you can register for the summit is by becoming an online pet health paid member. It is by far the most value for the money that you spend um, and the cheapest way that you can join the Vet Rehab Summit. So if budget is an issue for you, that's the route that you've got to go. You've got to, um, or you don't have to, but that's the budget friendly option is to become an online pet health member and then register for the summit. Our members get some VIP treatment at the summit with some special offers as well. It really is the best value for money. And I'm forgetting something, recordings. So the Vet Rehab Summit is a live event, but you will be able to watch the recordings of the webinars for 30 days afterwards. Only 30 days, webinars won't be added to the online pet health memberships like they usually are. They will only be available now, live, and then for 30 days after the event. Okay. If there are any questions from you guys about how to register for the summit or anything related to the summit, please ask them. And I'm going to invite you guys to join our conversation, ask Michelle questions as we go through and as we chat. We are here to chat to you guys. So Michelle, please introduce yourself and your journey into understanding the fascia. Uh, hi, guys. My name is Michelle Broadhurst. I am a doctor of chiropractic. I'm a CCRP. I'm a, a member of FIAMA, which is a, a fellow of the International Academy of Medical Acupuncture. Um, I've been in practice for a minute um, since the early 2000s, so over 20 years. And my I was a chiropractic sports physician and I'm a chiropractic acupuncturist. So um, I wear many hats and now I uh, help Northeast seminars out by doing a myofascial practitioners course for them. Um, so I, uh, when I started in practice, I was doing humans and it, this is even before the days of Tom Myers and all of those guys. So with acupuncture uh, and understanding the meridian process, especially um, starting to go through the myofascial chains that are have been very well documented for thousands of years in ch traditional Chinese medicine. Fascia became a huge part of my practice. I was treating lots of sports people and uh, being able to use very different and multiple modalities. I started having a very, very well-known functional and structural practice. So we would use the benefits of joint manipulation and fascial treatment to get the best and the most efficient um, outcome for our patients. So when I started doing animals in the early 2000s, it naturally translated into my practice. So, um, and from there, it's just grown and grown and grown and grown. And the knowledge of fascia has just really, um, you know, started coming to the forefront. When I was studying in the 90s, they would tell us to pick out all that white stuff during anatomy dissection. That was really irritating. And now we realize that it's really the foundation of everything in the body. <clears throat> so the, I, I have a small animal practice in um, Texas, and I travel worldwide lecturing and I have three books about uh, fascia and um, the myofascial um, system in equines and canines. Uh, so if you guys are interested in that, they're on Amazon, the clinic, uh, clinician's guide to myofascial pain in the canine and the equine patient. So yeah, so that has really been uh, my journey. And I have them somewhere. <laughs> I wanted to show you guys, but I can't see them in my oh. shelf. <laughs> um, and they've evolved a little bit over the last. So there's a new, and there's a new version which has a lot more information, which is great. Oh, and awesome. and now we've actually just started a website called Integrative Animal Solutions, which are going to be holding the courses. So the animal, the horse course is out, uh, which is the first uh, level of my fascial pain for horses and. The dog is going to be, the canine version is going to be available from December. So very excited Amazing. about that. And we're going to be deep diving into all these things and the link between meridians and myofascial planes and tr all these sorts of different things. So, um, yeah, it's going to be a multi-tiered course. So I'm very, very, very excited about it. And I think it's going to pull a lot together for us as veterinary mm -hmm. professionals that we'll be able to treat our patients a lot more efficiently. 
Oh, I love that. When is that going to be ready? Uh, so the K9 one will probably be released end of December. The equine is currently available. Amazing. Okay. Yeah. If you guys are online pet health members and you're participating in our month of webinars challenge, we have a few webinars that Dr. Michelle presented. So you can add those to your list this month because they're brilliant. So go watch those um, and I'll share them afterwards as well. Okay. So how do the fascial lines tie in with the meridians? Well, they you know, if you're looking at TCM or even Japanese acupuncture, so I don't know, for those of you that are not acupuncturists and are not very aware of the nuances, there are very different kinds of acupuncture. There's Korean acupuncture, Japanese, Chinese, uh, there's even Parisian, um, which is very interesting. So if you start to go into the acupuncture, which has been around for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, you start to, to realize that what we're talking about today that seems revolutionary has really been around for thousands of years. So the acupuncturists have a firm belief that everything needs to be in balance in order to work effectively. So when you have dysfunction or imbalance in any meridian in the body, it causes um, a dis-ease, which turns into disease um, and dysfunction, and therefore it changes the entire ability of the body to work effectively. So when you look at meridians as such and you compare it to the myofascial lines that we're looking at today, they're actually very, very, very similar. Um, in fact, they completely almost overlap. So it brings into, into the thought process that really we're dealing with the same system. And in particularly, one meridian has stood out for the longest time as one that we never really fully understood. And that was the um, Sanjiao or the triple heater or triple burner meridian, because at one point it was explained to be vacuous or vacant, um, which doesn't really make sense from a Western perspective. But now that we understand a little bit more about it, we actually see that the triple heater meridian is really the base point for fascia and for the okay. lymphatic system. So uh, let me pull up a little. I'll Please, we, I think we should see that because okay. I don't even know what the sand gel looks like. Okay, so <laughs> let's just show you, and this is um, just a little... Um, a little video kind of viewpoint of it on the dog. So if you look at it on the dog, basically it goes, and I'm going to walk you through the channel. It begins on the fourth toe and then it goes on the outside corner of the nail because that's where all meridians start is really on the nail bed. And then it runs um, to the carpus on the lateral aspect and then goes between the radius and ulna to the tip of the elbow, up the back of the arm to the shoulder and then behind the top of the shoulder, it joins with it and two other meridians, one being the small intestine and then the governing vessel. And then it goes over the shoulder and then it goes internally um, to the pericardium, which is a different meridian, in the upper burner, to the abdomen in the middle and lower burners. And then it comes back through the chest um, and it goes up the side of the neck, around the back of the ear. And then one branch goes to meet the gallbladder um, channel on the forehead. And then the other one descends to join the small intestine channel on the cheek. Um, so this is what it basically looks like on a horse. It does this, okay? Now what's really interesting, and I was showing this to Ine earlier, is this is the meridian pathways of on a horse the dog's very similar. And for those of you that have Rika and Vika's book, you can see that they correlate quite significantly with the myofascial um, kinetic lines that we're talking about. Um, and to be more specific, um, if you're looking at like the superficial dorsal line that they talk about in the book, and by the way, I have the book and I think it's great. The superficial dorsal line, it correlates with the bladder meridian. Mm -hmm. uh, that runs with the governing vessel. And then if you're looking at things like the superficial ventral line, that runs with the stomach meridian. 
and the conception vessel, as well as the deep ventral line. And then when you're looking at the front limbs, really, we're looking at a very, very well correlated junction with your lung, your um, pericardium, your heart, uh, triple heater, large intestine and small intestine really do correlate a lot with your front. Uh, is it your lateral lines, your protraction and your retraction lines? So if you've been studying Vipka and Rika's book, you can actually see how the meridians literally, these myofascial lines overlap on the meridians. Okay, so our our sanja, which we're talking about, is this is this light green or the green one? That's kind of the the sanja um, is the triple warmer, which is this light pink. Okay. Oh, the, okay, the light pink one. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if we go back to this picture, you can see how that mm. runs with those frontal lines. Okay. Mm. Now, I'll tell you why all of this, and this is why I picked this topic, is it's not really the meridian itself that is important. It's the organ. So when we talk about organs in Chinese medicine, we're not really talking about like the liver as the liver. We're not talking, we're talking about um, a totally different concept to what one thing is to be true. So like in human, in, in Western medicine, like the liver is just the liver. It doesn't have any correlation with mm -hmm. anything else. Yes, it works with the kidneys and the gallbladder and all that sort of thing. But in, in Eastern medicine, everything has to work together in order to be functional. So the San Jiao is made up or the triple, let's call it the triple heater or the triple burner because otherwise it gets a little bit complicated has three different burner regions. So it's got an upper a middle and a lower Mm -hmm. And it's really responsible for all fluid flow throughout the body. Now, what's interesting about this, and, and I'm just going to draw, this is a really beginner kind of thing, but we're going to draw some correlations. So if you look at collagen, collagen is always attached to a helical water molecule. I don't know if you know that, but it's always attached to a helical water molecule. And if you look at fascia being so heavily collagen, actin, and myosin, and my myofibroblasts and you know we've got all this fantastic fantastic extracellular matrix and all of these things all lumping together it's really important for the movement of fluid and if fascia is ever dysfunctional most of the time it's because it's not well nourished and because we then get scarring of the fascia or tacking of the fascia or whatever it is that you want to call it but basically, we get lack of nutrition going to an area that creates ischemia that then creates dysfunction in that fascial area. Mm. And a lack of hydration. Correct. So, and hyaluronic acid is one of the biggest things with fascia that is so super important. Now, when you're looking at the Sanjiao Meridian and you're looking at these three different burners and how they all work together, basically, the upper one is, is responsible for intake, the middle is for assimilation, and the lower is for elimination. So you're looking at a thoracic, an abdominal, and a pelvic portion that make up this triple, triple heater meridian, right, and, and okay. organ as such. So the correlations between the two and, the, uh, and triple heater's main, main function is to coordinate with the nervous system mm -hmm. and basically pull together on a multi-organ or multi-meridian level all of the meridians so that we have the body working in harmony. Does that sound like something familiar? I, I love that because I, I, I love that this is like a front limb line because when we look at all the lines, they're very much like back to front connecting. And then the front limb lines look like, like they're separate, like they're a separate thing and not part of the rest of the body and so this this kind of perspective is taking that that front limb more of the protraction line but taking that front limb line and then going well it's actually very viscerally connected and what causes the the fluid flow in the body right well am i on the right track <laughs> yes Yes. So one of the other things that you got to remember in Chinese medicine is that nothing ever works on its own. 
So yeah. you're never, ever going to have as, a, you know, a, a good acupuncturist is never going to treat one meridian only. Mm. So the reason why I was talking about how the channel runs is you, it's very important to understand the interconnectivity between other other meridians so it links with the small intestine it links with the gallbladder it links with the governing vessel which then interacts all the way down into the hind limb because those are where those meridians are yeah okay so if you take one thing it's never and i know i've said this a million times in all my lectures it's never just one thing ever it's an interconnectivity of all these things together. So understanding the myofascial lines are important. Understanding how they connect with everything else is imperative. Mm, I love that. Because mm, this is so interesting. Guys, if you have questions, please. Yeah. So if there is dysfunction in one meridian, let's say triple heater just as a meridian, not an organ, as a meridian, if there is dysfunction there, there's going to be a knock-on effect going all the way through into all these other different meridians that is going to have that change in biomechanics, in fascia. You know, if you want to make it just completely like mainstream Western, like if you stub your toe and you get a scar around your baby toe, the chances are you're going to have dysfunction all the way through because the fascia is now going to interact differently. Same thing with the meridians. If there is dysfunction in a meridian or disease or just anything along those lines, we're going to have a knock-on effect throughout the whole body. So the San Zhao as such is such an important thing because it creates, it connects the front, the back and everything in between. I think that has definitely been the theme throughout our prelims is that everything is connected. Uh, we, you can't just look at one, one isolated, even an isolated line, you know, it isn't isolated from the rest of the body. And I, 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 I love that. That's, that's definitely what I'm getting out of the prelims um, this month. So can you, we've been talking a little bit about um not only treating them, but also understanding these lines. And acupuncture has come up in our conversation, so I'd love to ask you a little bit more about that. But in terms of identifying these meridians, mm -hmm. is this something that was done through, like, can you follow them in dissections? How do you, how are they identified? How do we say this is what it is? That is a great question. So really, we don't know. It has been around for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And um, I suppose if you really, I mean, there's so much, there is so much research in acupuncture, knowing that these, these meridians exist and that these points exist, right? Um, where it originally came from, we don't even have, okay. uh, this was before we could write. Um, you know, we have some documentation that's a couple of thousand years old from China, um, but it's also a lot is lost in translation. So I think like most things that are remarkable, um, there is no real proof. So that we do know that as far as acupuncture goes and as far as fascia goes and all of these things that coinc coincide is that there is electrical activity that goes on through mm -hmm. the meridian. Mm -hmm. So that is our probably best bet. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't think many people have really questioned the origin as such or of the meridians because it works. Um, <laughs> so until it doesn't, they may have a different approach. But really, and Japanese, like I say, the, the different acupuncture techniques um, have slightly different points and so on and so forth. But it's been carried over for thousands and thousands of years, and and so it's never really been investigated. I would imagine, and this is just my perspective, because I've never investigated it. Because if something works, I'm not going to um, go deep dive into it. Yeah, no. I really. Um, I think that's fine. Very I smart think the, study, but I think the reason that I'm asking is because you know these uh, the myofascial lines have been dissected out, and so I'm like, well have these these meridians like is it something that can be dissected out is it something where we can follow and measure the connection is it not it isn't right or wrong it was just a question <laughs> 100%, but that's why i think it's so important to understand yeah. 
mentioned that there, you know, if you look at triple heater and sun as, as an organ, again, mm. not as a meridian, as an organ, it is the biggest organ and it's bigger than skin. It goes throughout the whole body. It allows for fluid movement. It allows for lymphatic flow. And that's why I say there's quite a significant difference between an organ and a meridian. Um, mm -hmm. And yet an organ as we see it is not an organ in Chinese medicine. So, and, you know, if you look at the mesenteric um, system, so, you know, the mesenteric system is basically the um, peritoneum and dealing with the, with the gut and the enteric nervous system. And that's all parietal fascia. Um, mm -hmm. And if you look at that connection again between the lower burner and the elimination and the assimilation in the middle burner, all of those different things, they all really co correlate and co coincide with each other. Uh, Kiku Matsumoto is a fantastic acupuncturist who has written many books. And she talks a lot about the fascia and uh, the fascia connection to acupuncture mm -hmm. and how important and imperative it is to um, treat that system, the San Jiao system as a whole, because of the, you know, the, the westernized, if we can call it that, fascial connections that we're seeing. And not only on a lymphatic or a nutritional basis, we see it from a neurological perspective, the gut, everything is interconnected. And one of the biggest things that we're learning as practitioners is how less invasive you ha you can be with when treating the fascial system than what we earlier thought, you know, and the the moderation and the tissue movements that we can create. If you look at shockwave as a modality, um, using it at the lowest setting can really change tissue modulation quite substantially without being majorly invasive. Um, mm. As Western practitioners, we like to do a lot. Um, yes. If you actually really start to understand the intricacies of things, you could use one needle as an acupuncture, as a, as a practitioner, and create a complete unraveling of the fascia. Mm -hmm. um, I got to have some fun with with the vet in, in South Africa recently, and I was talking to him about tethering points in the fascia. And I was like, okay, great, put a needle here. And literally, it was incredible. The entire fascial system just started releasing. And all of the pain points that we had palpated on a structural and a functional level before completely dissipated with just putting it so what is a tethering point one of my favorite things about fascia is it's like learning a whole new language honestly <laughs> what is a tethering point so you always have an, an origin right so in acupuncture you're talking about an acupuncture point right in in western medicine we talk about myofascial points or trigger points right um, and there are lots of these, but there's a there's a place, in my opinion, um, and just in being in practice for so long and dealing with the fascial system, I really look for what I call as a tethering point. So there's a point, there's a place in the body, and it may be far away from where you're seeing the symptom, where the fascia is basically connecting and creating a level of tethering. So if you take a piece of cotton and you pull it together and you stick an elastic band around it, everything else is going to crease around it. And you can iron out those creases till you blue in the face. But until you take that elastic band off, you're not going to actually allow it to straighten out. Mm. So a point of impact can do this. So an acute exacerbation, so like trauma or repetitive strain injury can cause this incredible bundle of fascial adhesion in an area. And if you release that elastic band, basically, everything else irons out. So that's what I call the tethering point. And this is exactly what we were finding, uh, the Svet and I who were working together. <clears throat> and so I was like, oh, my gosh, we've got to have trigger points everywhere in the longissimus, iliocostalis, rhomboids, lat dorsi, da, da, da. And he put a needle into the junctional area between the lat dorsi and the tricep. And it quivered for about 15 to 20 minutes sure. after the needle had been taken out. And we reevaluated the horse and all of those trigger points were gone. Sure. Okay. So basically, if you find, and yes, you'll have to treat a couple and blah, blah, you know, mm -hmm. go in. But the point is, is that for a lot of people who are treating the same trigger points over and over and over again, mm -hmm. 
it's because you're not finding the primary. So that mm -hmm. that feathering point keeps on creating the wrinkles, right? So you can mm -hmm. iron out the wrinkles and they might be straight for a while, but then if you don't find that initiating clump, mm -hmm. it's, gonna, it's gonna keep wrinkling. You've got to peel the onion. <laughs> Don't just stay yeah, yeah. in the same space. Peel that onion. Yeah. I'd love to ask you about the acupuncture point. So you say that you have this book, right? Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. And in for each line, they describe a specific treatment point. So let me look at the superficial dorsal line. It's it's there in the, in the butt, okay? Is mm -hmm. that the same point as would be your meridians, for your meridians? Is it, is it an acupuncture point? Is it a different point? They're all acupuncture points. So mm -hmm. most of the myofascial trigger points that we find are also, a lot of them are acupuncture points. So if you look at the bladder meridian, which mm -hmm. is basically your, your, your dorsal line, right? Mm -hmm. And then it runs all the way down. So yes, that's a bladder point. So yes, they are all linked to acupuncture points. So that's the beauty about all of this. And I think they've done great work for kind of demystifying this for a mm. lot of people who don't fully understand the concept. Again, I think that one has to treat what one finds. There's not mm. a magic, you know, Harry Potter moment where it's like we can just treat this or we can just treat that. I think one has to, again, lead it back, find, find the primaries, treat those. But yes, all of these points are, are, are pretty much based on, act, on on meridians. Okay. I love what you just said. And I want to highlight that because I think it's important that we realize that we're not, you know, we are, we are talking about fascia and we're learning about the lines. And for me, it's because we need to have a different perspective and we need to have more information, not because we have found the missing link of things that, you know, the missing piece of the puzzle. And now we're going to be able to wave our wand and fix our, our patients. It means we have a, a new perspective and new lens that we can use to start to to improve what we're doing, to be more effective, to meet them where they are. Different lens can make so much difference, but I'm not, we're not talking about a magic wand that's going to fix everything. So I thank you for saying that because I think it's very important. In, in our interview with Tovi, she spoke about, um, we, we, the question came up of uh, people, those of us who can't use needles, mm. and she recommended that we use a tuning fork as opposed to a needle. Have you ever heard of that or seen that? Because that is apparently a, yeah. more of a traditional approach that, that is recognized. I just hadn't heard of it. Yeah, so remember what I was just saying earlier is that everything has an electrical conductivity, right? Mm. So using <laughs> tuning fork, you're basically um, using that electrical conductivity to transmit a force through that area so mm -hmm. the vibration and remember we're dealing with mechanoreceptors and we're dealing with fibroblasts and myofibroblasts which are um very very susceptible to any mechanical intervention um as well as electrical intervention so basically with the vibrational um effect that happens with the tuning fork yes you are running through that electrical pathway in a very different manner um and you know having said that everybody gets stuck on the needle thing you don't a needle is not a be-all and end-all um you know you can use your thumb you can use the back of a spoon you can use a fascial tool you can use anything it's it, it doesn't matter as long as you're finding the right point to treat, treat it however you want. You want to use a laser, that's photons and, and, and electrons. It's, again, it's a change in, you're changing the electrical conductivity through that area, and that's really what we're trying to achieve. What are you looking forward to learning at the Vetriab Summit this year? Are you coming? Are you joining us at the summit? Michelle? I am. I, I, I am definitely going to be there. Uh, I might be late because it's early for us. Um, so I'm going to be watching some of them after the fact. Um, I, you know, I, I, I've been, like I said, I've, I've been a fan of Tom Myers for many years. So it's been great to see the progression in that somebody's taken the time to put it into the animal world because we've mm -hmm. always known it's there. Um, 
we just haven't kind of like put it in a book. So I'm super grateful that they've done that. I think it's wonderful for practitioners to be able to really start to understand it and visualize it in a different form. Um, I think for me, I would just love to see how it's all going to be brought together and kind of illustrated as to how people can use it in practice because uh, a lot of us are already doing that. So I'm really interested to see um, different perspectives on how it's being used and learn about that. So, yeah, I think it's a great topic. I think fascia is everything. Um, I think everything else we do around it is secondary, but that's just because I'm a total fascial geek. Um, <laughs> but so I'm, I'm very excited to hear them chat and, uh, and see what they say. So, yeah. Awesome. Uh, we have a question here. So in one of the previous prelims, it was with Toby Dew. She mentioned that the needle needs to hit the acupuncture point within like one millimeter of accuracy. Do, do we need to be that completely accurate when, when we're using acupuncture? What, what are your thoughts on that? I think it depends what your, what your, um, what your goal is. So mm -hmm. Remember that acupuncture has many, many different hats. So are you treating an organic dysfunction? Um, are you treating a, a, a pain syndrome? Or what are, what are we treating? Because um, for organic dysfunctions, there are very specific um, acupuncture points. So if you're looking at inflammatory points, you're looking at large intestine 4, stomach 36, um, and so on and so forth. So the accuracy there needs to be... I would I would agree with that. I think if you if you're looking at creating doing something for a very specific reason, if you're looking at it from a myofascial perspective, uh, and I'm going to annoy a lot of acupuncturists out there, I think you need to treat what you find. Um, I think we get very stuck in a cookbook. Um, mentality of oh if I'm doing if I find this I need to do that um, I don't think that the body read the book so we find different things all the time so you need to treat what you're finding in your patient um, but again I wasn't privy to this to the this prelim so I am maybe taking this out of context so forgive me if I am so as far as organic dysfunction I think you need to be accurate as far as treating lines and myofascial and things like that, depending on what your goal is, um, I think you've got a little bit more wiggle room. I like that. I think that is a fantastic thought to actually leave us with. Is there, what, what, what would you say is the one thing that you want people to remember from our conversation? Everything's connected. Yes. <laughs> there we go. All right, so for me, when we change the, th the way we look at things, the things we look at change, your perspective matters. And this connectivity has come through all of our prelims. Um, so I hope that you guys that are listening have taken that away as well. I hope that you will be joining us at the Vet Rehab Summit. We only have one more prelim left and it's on Wednesday. And then it's summit time. There are 11 days to go, guys, counting down. Uh, if you're partaking in the webinar challenge, <clears throat> let us know how we're doing post some pictures of your um of your logbook so we can see what it's looking like for all of you we would love to yeah really get involved in your journey of learning this month michelle thank you so much for joining us you're very welcome thanks for having me bye bye if you enjoyed this podcast please hit the subscribe button so you get notified every time i load a new podcast i'm here every week talking to vet rehab therapists from all over the world about all things vet rehab a big thanks to our sponsor, Response System. Their sponsorship allows us to be able to give this podcast out to you for free. So go and check them out. You can go to responsesystem.com. Don't forget to bookmark the next Vet We Have Summit on Friday the 10th and Saturday the 11th of November. Come and be a part of the world's largest online veterinary rehabilitation conference created specifically for you, the Vet We Have community. Online Pet Health members get VIP complimentary access to the Vet We Have Summit. For more information about continued education for vet rehabers, you can go to onlinepetshealth.com.